I'm I'm navigating the whole uh, TikTok world right now because it's pretty interesting to me what goes viral and what doesn't. Yeah, and, dude, I know. Don't get me al- started. The, the algorithm the algorithm is different too because on Instagram, you know how you if you post something on Instagram and it doesn't do well in the first hour, it's probably not going to do well. Yeah. On totally TikTok. Different. On TikTok I've had videos blow up that I made 2 weeks ago. And That's by blow up, is. I mean get a few thousand views. <laughs> yeah. most, most of mine most of mine <laughs> get around like a few hundred to a thousand, which a lot of times is more than Instagram. I feel like TikTok's way more Organic. That's what I'm saying, man. Like it's yeah. the the growth is just way more organic. Like you can you can switch it up too. You uh, I like uh, right now, I like I got on the app and I just started making everything, bro. I like to just because it's mm-hmm. more practice, more content. Like the more you try, the more you fail. Like the more you you'll just like eventually be good at the end. And since I didn't have a following, I wasn't really like caring too much about what my content was so i i was just making stuff and then now i'm like actually like seeing what is my niche and like how the hashtags actually help you in that sense so maybe like mm-hmm. using uh for you page as an as a hashtag isn't actually like that yeah that great because you're just like giving it to everybody instead of like the people who actually like need to see your content or want to see your content yeah, th- there are a couple people I follow on TikTok that give TikTok tips. That's the thing behind their account whenever a Same. feature comes up. Or there was this woman that made a video about hashtags and how on Instagram people search hashtags. So when you want to be found in a hashtag that you look through and you and you think, okay, this is similar to my work, people are clicking on that hashtag and then you go to it like normal Instagram shit. But on TikTok, people don't search on hashtags. TikTok uses your hashtags to kind of place you in a group of similar creators. So you're, if you put on your for you page in your hashtag or you just do hashtag viral, you're making it harder for TikTok to group you with people that are in your content. So you might actually be hurting yourself. I know. And at the same time, though, you do want that like unlimited kind of... Uh, that variety too because i mean some of my content like i would say is only geared towards calisthenics like fitness mm-hmm. people like people that do handstands i don't know like those kind of people but then there's some kind of content that's just i mean i'm just making for fun and like it's intriguing and it's like really visually appealing so i that's where i'm like stuck on that sense but yeah I, it's a uh... process I put up some stuff about podcasting, like how to do remote podcasting. And then I did one video on things that I've learned with podcasting that have also translated to dating, like speaking to women more confidently and and some things that I just realized about myself. And that did really well. So then I started doing more dating tips, like how to approach talking to a stranger or something or things that i've learned from talking to someone for 90 minutes that oh, you can I saw that one on the ground yeah dude it was and it's weird because it, it did decently on instagram but then on tiktok i guess that whatever for whatever reason that video just did really well so i'm trying to experiment right now where every so often i'll take a video from tiktok and put it on instagram and just see how it does kind of bounces off one each Same, other man so, um so one of my videos like got a, a bunch of views on on uh instagram and like mm-hmm. not a lot of views on on tiktok because yeah. it's also me like not knowing how to create for the platform just yet or like still experimenting with the whole idea <laughs> and like knowing what actually pops and like knowing what's actually engaging and what the algorithm like puts in first like before anything like it just wants Mm -hmm. you to stay on the app for as long as possible so you're gonna need to first hook people and then let them want to stay till the end of the video like however long that takes you but that's the main idea and what you want to achieve yeah so 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 to get more into what you do and and tiktok is definitely a part of that with the with the ever-changing technological landscape how would you describe to other people what you do? Um, first and foremost, um, a human being that's like trying to survive and spread good vibes. But 
secondly i'm an entertainer that's like the main thing like i i move to entertain people like i i grab a guitar sometimes to entertain people um i picked up fire performing as well so i uh spin fire ploy which is like a handle a chains and then wicks that you light on fire and you spin them like to music mm-hmm. um i do handstands um i was in the florida state circus so that's kind of how i got into handstands um Back when I was in high school, I was into musical theater, so that's kind of how I was expressing how was I, I like entertaining and making people laugh. Honestly, like that's that's like the one thing that I'm just I'm an entertainer. So to- and it's and it honestly like took me a long time to just be all right with just saying I'm an entertainer. Because it's like, oh, how are you changing the world? How are you affecting <laughs> other people? Yeah. But it's it's that that it's a, a deeper message within just entertaining that I'm also trying to spread, which is just, I mean, look out for each other, like have love, like in the forefront of what you're doing so that everything else so that it spreads to everything that you do, you know, and and like the people around you, it helps and it affects the world, makes it a better place. Mm-hmm that's really what I want to do. <laughs> so to catch people up on what you've been doing the past few years, and, and you gave me a synopsis last time we spoke about some of the projects you've been involved in, and, and you mentioned the the circus at Florida State. Mm-hmm. In the past two to three years, or, or even before that, if you feel like it would be helpful to kind of bring people up to speed now, could you give a synopsis of where you kind of started in entertainment i know you said you were a production assistant and then you were working in videography in colorado got reintroduced to yoga everything like that so help help me uh catch people up to where you are now yeah this is a long story go, go, <laughs> go for it dude yeah that's no, what uh, that's a... what podcasts are for absolutely um so yeah i was i was born in in caracas venezuela i Moved here when I was eight uh, to Western Florida. This is Western Florida. Um, was raised here. Um, but started started as a swimmer uh, when I was ten years old. Uh, kind of got into that jock life a little bit. Uh, that's kind of how I got my athletic background. And then when I was in high school, like towards the last two years, I've always thought about being in the theater and you know, entertaining, because I always, Mm -hmm. like, love to make my friends laugh, like, I was pretty much the class clown, like, all my life, and Mm -hmm. that's what I identified with, Yeah. so I got into theater, I finally got the, um, the call to go to the theater, or just me, like, owning up and, like, having the courage to audition, um, for a musical theater class, and I got a role, I was in, like, various roles in musicals and then after that I kind of just stopped doing the whole swimming thing stopped doing the whole musical theater thing and went to Florida State Mm -hmm. Um, did not know what I was doing was kind of lost there's a lot of people there that it's just fraternities and you know things that you get lost in like people just want to go to college and like hey like let me just pay so that I can just I mean, like, it's not like, not, not like every frat is like that, but they get people. That's how they hook people in because you go in to college, not knowing what you're doing, not knowing Mm -hmm. who your friends are, not knowing who you are in general. And then like, they're like, Hey, like we already have like established friends that you can have, you know? So there's a lot of things I could have gone into that. And I was trying to be, but then I just felt myself just like really disingenuous. And then there was, it, I just want, was, I just want to say uh, yeah. to, to pause real quick. I, I get the, the fraternity and brotherhood thing. Cause I, I played baseball in college the, the whole time I was there. So it's like you come into a school where you know, nobody, and then you automatically have 30 people that you're going to be hanging out with every weekend. And so if I was just uh, a student who wasn't a, a student athlete, but 
you know, it was just more of like the the regular routine. You you didn't have to go to practice, lift, and stuff like that. I could definitely see myself turning towards a fraternity, which some guys did, even though they played. Which I don't know how they they swung the initiation because that that was rough during the the practice season. But yeah. I I I definitely I I know that some people may have different views on fraternities, but as an athlete that was close to a lot of guys in frats i know that they got a lot of shit from the school but they also did provide a really good time for other people and a lot of times out of their own pocket and i i had a i had a close bond with a lot of those guys and and fraternity life so i know there are many different sides to it and florida state is a whole nother level than uh, i went to university of richmond which only has four or five thousand people I actually used to date a girl at Florida State, and so I went down and partied for a Florida State Clemson football game for a weekend, mm-hmm. and it's like a whole nother planet. But yeah, I just, I just wanted to get that in about the the fraternity culture. And again, like it's just it's a case by case scenario. Like yeah. that's just what it was at Florida State at the moment. Maybe not for certain frats. Maybe not for anything. It was just a reflection of what I was feeling at that time, mm-hmm. which was an identity crisis <laughs> and yeah. not knowing what I was doing. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I could have jo- just jumped in and, uh, you know, try and like join anything that I could get to, but mm-hmm. I really f- wasn't feeling that. And more so than that, like I was just like walking by a circus tent, like every single day, like thinking like, what is this thing? And mm-hmm. like, finally someone in there, like, looked at me and was like dude you come here like every day just like walking by like and like stop to stare like why don't you come and audition and i was like i mean i've never done i've never done any of this stuff like i don't know yeah. anything like and he's like well you look like a strong guy i was like going to the gym all the time but i didn't really have any skills mm-hmm. and sure enough like the next morning i just went and signed up and I went, did the audition, passed the strength test, got a call back, and then got in a hand balancing routine. And uh, what was the other thing? Uh, quartet adagio, which is like quartet adagio. Guys, yeah, it's like two guys swinging a girl, and I was the catcher. So they, it was like they would just <laughs> swing her, and I would catch her, like, like. <laughs> pretend she's like this yeah and like i'm catching her like that i know people in the podcast can't hear this but <laughs> no the, i'm i'm um, recording so some some people will uh be able to see it but yeah you basically yeah. if you're just listening to this you uh i guess you could google uh, or youtube quartet adagio quartet too adagio, i'm sure there'll be yeah. vid- videos on there that would be the best way but it sounds yeah. like this crazy movement that i'm sure takes a, an enormous amount of strength to make look easy and stability. yeah at the end of it we like jump rope like i was jump roping the girl like she was like a human <laughs> jump rope it was insane but that's crazy but all of that like i had to just train for in ba- practically a year so i was like i mean on top of like school work and stuff like that but i finally like found you know, something that I was like, really, really passionate about. So and it joined the two aspects of my life that I really, really enjoyed, which is like movement. And well, I was doing swimming. And then now circus entertaining, musical theater. It was amazing. So did you stick with that all through college? The Florida State Circus? Yeah, so I did. I did three years in a circus. And then on the last year, I dislocated my shoulder and um, I had plans to go uh, audition for circuses and like train after college. And that kind of was like a huge, a huge downer for me. I, I like realized that I wasn't invincible. And like, I mean, you could tell me like, uh, of course you got injured. Like you're doing handstands on top of people doing this and that, but like, you don't really know until you go through it. And Mm-hmm. realize that you're you're really just not invincible so uh, yeah I, i've yeah. had many many moments like that in baseball and i mean I'm, I'm nowhere near as athletic as you to 
to be in the circus, but in baseball, one of the worst movements you can do for your shoulder is throwing an object at high speed over the top. And so there's a lot of people that say similar things. Like, of course, you, you know, tore your rotator cuff. You throw a baseball a hundred times a day or, or, you know, of course you fucked up your elbow. You, you throw a baseball and people, it, like, it's a dangerous movement and that's what comes with it. And your job as a athlete is to make the movement as safe and efficient as possible for you to do your job. So, and that Technique sounds like a huge part of what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So, so yeah. No, I was just gonna say. So, so you uh, fin you finished Florida State and you you hurt your shoulder. So I I well I hurt my shoulder right before my last uh my last set of shows, which was gotcha. like so, like it was, it was really bad. <laughs> I was really like kind of depressed for about six months in the recovery, and then all of that like graduation. I didn't get to perform on my last year circus banquet <laughs> all of yeah. that like wrapped into one like bye i didn't get to uh whatever and i was a, a captain the circus banquet then. sounds lit yeah it was oh my god the trampoline that's where i picked up uh fire performing actually i'm like no way. circus part like parties like i was like so amazed by this guy and like he was like hey dude like you can have it <laughs> and i was <laughs> like wow like and now i'm like performing it at festivals like this guy just changed my life he doesn't even know it i don't even know his mm. name <laughs> well but, shout out to uh the guy who introduced you to fire yeah shout out to him wherever um, he is so so th yeah that was that was really a hard hit for me and what i was studying at the time at Florida State, what I graduated with was uh, digital media marketing um, mm -hmm. uh, major. So I went off to I went off to um, production assist at Jersey Shore, um, like various different places. I I also did worked with ESPN while I was at Florida State because I was filming their. Um, their college games so like football basketball and they were pretty big so we got to mm -hmm. like we got to espn too and sometimes to like be espn so that got me a little bit a little bit of work when i got back to miami so that's how i got the job at um working for for jersey shore working for mtv yeah I wanted to ask you, because uh, you that's a unique job to be a production assistant at Jersey Shore, and I, and I know you have a lot of, I'm sure, behind-the-scenes viewpoints of reality TV but more yeah. so than the average person. What is something that people would be surprised to learn about Jersey Shore or the, or, or the way the show operates? I mean, it's... I. I don't know how you could not know this, but I mean, it's not all real. Like it is like the personalities are for sure real. Like these people are exactly how you would think they are. But the story behind it, like where they go, what they do, it's like, I mean, there's always a producer mm -hmm. in the back of the, in, in the back of the cab or like whatever saying like, Hey, this <laughs> like talking about shit. The, Ask oh, yeah. about the girls because now we're gonna jump to the girls probably in this edit. So yeah, kind of like they're talking, but they say like, "Hey, like this." And I also bartended for The Bachelor um, while I was in L.A. So that oh, no was way. also huge. Yeah, it was hilarious because the producer would come in like, "Like, hey, Jack, how do you feel about Lauren like going out with your girl like, <laughs> like kind of just starting." starting things up like stirring it up and then and then he'll yeah, be trying like, to like start some shit yeah yeah he'll come into like the interview room like gas these people up and then just say okay go and then just step out and he'll, <laughs> like ran to the camera it's hilarious um so so it's like they're doing the producers do all this behind the scenes kind yeah. of poking poking and prodding to get people into certain mind states and then that's when they turn the camera on so you don't get to see all the the build up to that exactly and there's so much like downtime and these these like productions are like 
a month and a half. Like people think they're like months. People think they're, mm. I, I don't know. People think they're like years sometimes, but it's just like, it goes so fast. Like, and it's go, go, go every single moment. Like there's a crew there 24 hours a day, just waiting to see what they do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes yeah. it's entertaining and most of the time it's really not. <laughs> I, I don't know what they do with Jersey Shore, but I've heard that for The Bachelor, they actually restrict your access to the outside world. Like you can't talk to people, even this guy got family. Kicked out. This guy got kicked, yeah, kicked out, out of for, Jersey Shore for yeah, reaching for out to people. Out. Or not for Jersey Shore, for uh, The Bachelor. For, for The Bachelor? Yeah, for, um, I don't know, posting something on the gram or something like that. That would make me go even more crazy, I feel like, because you have no connection to the outside world. If you feel like you are going crazy, it's not like you can talk to your brother or your mom or something or just see, you know, what else is going on outside of The Bachelor mansion. So all you have to go on is what producers are telling you, which probably try to make you go crazy, it sounds like, for good content. And then you just have nothing besides yourself. So if you're not mentally fit and emotionally fit going into that, then I could see that being a, a disaster, Yeah, which makes absolutely. good content. <laughs> Produ yeah, producers are makes, good at what they do. Yeah, producers no, are good at what they do. Yeah. It makes great content. And they they get them like just nicely buzzed. Like I'm a, I'm, I was a bartender. So mm -hmm. I mean, like I, it, you would only ha could give them like an ounce per hour. So like they would come in and like at the hour to get the one out. It was like only one tr half ounce drink that they could get or like one shot an hour. Was, and they, and would they, they put a limit. It, they put they a put limit a, on yeah they put yeah. a huge limit like people don't know this and i mean like one of the nights like one like one of them got buzzed even though he had like an ounce and a half or something because he mm -hmm. just doesn't drink and they were just like yelling at the bartenders like <laughs> all, yeah. all the all night but like it was just the guy like he's just a huge lightweight <laughs> yeah dude if i if i knew that i could only have an ounce and a half of liquor i would fast the entire day beforehand which, which that's maybe, what i'm saying that's what he maybe, probably did maybe this guy did it he was like purposely like i'm gonna i'm gonna eat nothing so i get fucked up off of two shots because there have been times where like i'll do i, I do a 24-hour fast every so often and there have been times where i'll go out to break the fast like it'll it'll just will line up where uh sometimes my friends want to go do something so the first thing that enters my body may be like a vodka soda and i'm like holy shit one drink is fucking me up right now because there's <laughs> nothing else in my stomach dude it's crazy be like that though so so how did you how did you get from what you're doing as a production assistant and back towards the the movement and entertainment because you were you were around entertainment obviously you're attracted to entertainment regardless if you're doing the movement stuff or not but what brought you back to combining both of those so <clears throat> like i said it was really bad uh when i got injured i really got like self-sabotaged myself and told me i couldn't do anything like after that that i couldn't recover from an injury like mm -hmm. that was just my mindset i don't know why i was thinking that but, what was the I mean, shoulder injury again what, it was what? i dislocated my shoulder but mm -hmm. it was like a bad dislocation because i i had it dislocated for like two hours mm -hmm. and like i didn't know it was the first time that i had it had ever happened so um like all my ligaments were like really really stretched out so that's why it took a little bit longer for the recovery but at the same time like I mean, I was still doing handstands like mm -hmm. uh, six months later. I just wasn't doing it like too much. Like I, I kind of had given that up a little bit. And yeah. um, so I, I did the whole production assisting thing. And then I traveled a lot too. I drove from Miami to Alaska and back. With Jesus Christ. Two, yeah, with two of my best friends uh, just camped out everywhere for 35 days. Um, went to like Sounds all nuts. national parks. It was amazing. It was if anybody could do this, like I highly recommend it. You need to do it with like people that you love, though. 
but yeah you're in close quarters it's like it changed the whole aspect of my life uh like the whole scheme of the world and is then, there any experience on that trip that sticks out in particular and anything like if you were to tell your grandkids about that drive from miami to alaska what story would you tell them if you had to choose one wow it's it's crazy because it's one of those it's one of those stories that you're like it's one of those like what are the what are they called when like when they're just like myths legends or whatever it like we, like a hallucination or something uh it, not even like it's a, a whatever tale oh like i know like a big like bigfoot or something or yeah exactly like, like exactly like yeah. big fish tail like one of those yeah. yeah um so me and my friends we had finally gotten to alaska like it was crazy like driving the canadian alaskan highway we were mm -hmm. at fairbanks then we made it to denali that was like the one place we wanted to see um denali is like the second peak the second highest peak in uh, North America mm -hmm. or the first. I don't know. I, I think it's the first. It used to be Mount McKinley, right? Now they call yeah. it Denali. Okay. Nice. So, it, yeah, it's the big one in um, tribal mm -hmm. language. Um, so we had made it there and we were like really stoked. We got all our stuff, like went to go camp. Like our big thing was to camp in Denali. So we went to this like salmon river. It wasn't a great idea because there were salmon like still there. And I mean, we had seen bear like a couple yeah. miles there's down. there's salmon there, bears. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but there are, there were always there. Mm-hmm um we we just needed to find a spot that was kind of clear from the the river yeah so we set up all of our stuff and we were like a little bit worried about the bears but we just like we were having such a good time like just looking out like the sunset i don't know if you've ever seen a sunset on like really really high in the in the world like yeah like I, I was in alaska a few years ago actually um with my family so so we did we did catch a lot of good sunsets they're it like was amazing. four hours they're like four mm -hmm. hour sunsets of with yeah. like beautiful like vivid colors it's insane um, yeah yeah the sun uh depending on w how high you are latitude and what time of year we, we were there in august so that's exactly sun, when i was there yeah this the sun wasn't down for that long so so it'd take a while to go down and then it would stay down for a few hours and then it'd come back up so a lot of times you'd be going to sleep um for people who haven't been to alaska with I like you know it's one. like it feels like it's daytime yeah like you need the yeah. the blackout curtains or the 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 sleeping mask yeah so the sunset would start at like eight and then end at like 12 like 12 a.m yeah it's it's really really cool it's so um so we had gotten there we had all our stuff set up and then we we kind of just like we 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 walked two miles to get to that campsite so we kind of just like i don't know we're playing got distracted and like didn't see that there was like a, st a storm coming and there was a, it like i'm telling you this storm was so huge and we had like electronics like a, we had a drone with us like we had cameras laptops i don't know why we we brought all of that to the campsite but we did and we were just like what are we gonna do like we we set up all our stuff like we can't go back mm -hmm. and this tent wasn't even that great so it was like just blowing it like the wind was just catching it and it was just flattening it out so there was like no way we could escape and we literally just like looked up and like all of us prayed and this storm just went like just circled around us it was like the most insanely miraculous thing i had ever seen i don't know how it happened so it was it was raining and stuff all around you except it was where you raining were. it was the wind was blowing like we had no chance we like tried to get in the tent and it was just like coming down like this yeah like this tent had no chance like i don't know what we were thinking we weren't ready but we we just like looked up and like 
and there's so many stories from that trip too there was a night that we were camped out in yellowstone and we heard like something and then like there was a giant hole in our tent like the next morning and something tried to get in (laughs) yeah something tried to get in so and it it was but it's one i don't know i yeah i I definitely need to do a cross country i definitely need to do a trip like that and before i i always say someday but i'm just gonna say i will do it because someday is just never so i will do a trip like that exactly. um so so after that trip where were you at because you obviously you still had your shoulder injury and this is before you got back into yeah. movement stuff right yeah so i traveled there and then and then i started working at the jersey shore and mm-hmm. then um i got out of the jersey shore and started working at um at a, so i got a job at a cruise ship working as a video technician for six months so i was on the carnival um what was it carnival carnival cruise that sounds right yeah carnival sunshine that's carnival what it was sunshine, yeah. yeah so it was nice like i was it gave me it really gave me a chance to to like I don't know if anybody's like been to Wanadu City or anybody knows about Wanadu City, but it's like I don't know this, about it. It's a, kind of like a theme park for kids where they just like do different jobs in society, <laughs> but like yeah. as kids. So they they could bake, they could be models, they could like go, like have an airplane simulator, and it was like it was kind of like that, but just in a cruise ship. Like I like that's the way I was treating it because. I, I liked my job, but at the same yeah. time, I knew that it wasn't what I wanted to do. So, so you were like test test driving it as a I job. I was, like, just yeah. Just to see was how like, it was. I was like, just looking at like, even the navigators, like they're all Italian. <laughs> but like, I, yeah. was, I was like, what do they do? Like, what I don't yeah. want to do that. Like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do it. And I was just always gravitating towards the people on stage, like the musicians, the the performers the the, um just the people hosting like all of those people i was really friends with and like connected with and would always just like any time i had spare time like i would just spend it with them like either Mm -hmm. going up to jam on a song because i also play the guitar um so, so you were that, like surrounded by entertainment by people that were doing what you wanted to eventually do. Exactly, but I was in the tech aspect of it. So mm-hmm. every everybody knew also like they would look at me and be like you d- aren't in the right department. <laughs> yeah, like they and, would they would know what you the kind of you could sense that about people too. Sometimes I meet someone and especially in the creative space cuz you have for example for one podcast especially with the the bigger podcasts you have a producer you have maybe two or three audio engineers there you have someone controlling a second camera you have someone that's just kind of like running the whole show and so you meet a lot of people and you can tell sometimes that those people are good at their jobs but they want to be doing something different or they maybe want to be the podcaster or performer or music artist they don't just want to be in that world they want to they want to create in that world and i and i listen to um a, a lot of stand up comedians on podcasts and they a lot of them say that they started as the door guys at their favorite comedy club cuz they just wanted to be around these powerhouse comics and then as a result of getting that job they were around comedy which is what they wanted and then after that you gotta have the balls to get up on stage for for open mic. So, so I think everyone goes through um, stages like that 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 mm-hmm. stage where they're in the world and they see the world that they want to be a part of, but they're not yet creating in it yet, and they feel the need to start to do something to to start to be more proactive. Yeah, and it starts to like really, I don't know, like I'm a very intuitive person, so like that for me is like very daunting Mm -hmm. when i'm not living my truth honestly Mm -hmm. so uh, i got back from the cruise ship um 
did some traveling in Asia, went to Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam for two months. <clears throat> Is that the Golden Triangle, they call it, or something like that? I know there's a lot of heroin over there from, from I movies. The, I have no <laughs> idea. I didn't know heroin, but it was it was. A it's a good choice. Trip. Good choice. Yeah, it was life changing. Really yeah. cheap, really affordable, and like such amazing people, such good food. Mm -hmm. Um, came back, and just got, got it. Like I, w I was still like thinking, I don't know what I'm gonna do, so I'm just gonna get a job, like doing some other kind of video somewhere else that i love to go to like that mm -hmm. i would love to be at like a place i would love to be at but like still do video work for money mm -hmm. so i went to colorado um lived in avon for six months uh kind of was a ski bum for like two months uh, in the spring nice. or not a ski bum a snowboard bum but love that uh love the hiking trails like loved i just love the nature but i was still like trying to find myself a little bit mm -hmm. um i was working for Vail resorts so i was working in like studio cameras and editing a little bit and still there i was seeing like like that i was in the in the right area but like in the wrong department like i would look at yeah. the host and be like i can definitely do that and i love doing that yeah. so but in the whole like in while that whole thing was happening i was i joined a gym that had yoga and i stepped into that class and one of the like greatest yoga teachers that i, I mean like it was my first real like connection with a yoga teacher yeah. um and she inspired me to get back into movement so i and also like even more so than that like was meditation which also changed my life um were you still in the mindset of that your shoulder was never going to heal fully when you started yoga like you didn't think it was going to be better again or was it no, a little bit that, that's when i like that's when i wasn't even i wasn't even trying to be an entertainer at that point mm -hmm. so i was just like trying to you know do yoga like focus more on my flexibility and stuff and like still doing handstands because i know how to do them but like not really focusing on getting better at them so uh when i when i moved there i at first i really was just like focused on my health and that kind of just like kick-started like the hand balancing journey again like i was i was like working on my presses i was working on like different moves and really getting into calisthenics um just like looking up different workout routines in uh online in youtube actually mm -hmm. gabba satorno was like one of the first people i i uh, looked up this these are his pants yeah. what what's his name i'll i'll put a link to it in the podcast yeah G gabba satorno Gabo Satorno, okay. Yeah, he he's he actually runs a like a a whole academy online for hand balancing and and yoga. Dope. So, yeah, that that kind of started that journey, and then I was was really getting into like more like, hey, like I really just want to be an entertainer. Like I want to give this whole like circus thing another try. So mm -hmm. I moved to LA thinking, you know, like, oh, sh now I'm like, yeah. now I'm in the space and like with all these creators and amazingness, but I really kind of just did it um, because people say to do that. Like, or, yeah, it's like, like the land of opportunity. If you want to, if you want to make something of yourself as an entertainer, LA is a spot where a lot of people tend to go yeah and it's, but, it's like known as that spot but and it is it is a great spot to collaborate with people but you also just i mean you got to know first what you want what you really really want and mm -hmm. i really thought i did but i wasn't i wasn't absolutely clear i knew i wanted to be an entertainer so i moved out there and i knew it had something to do with circus and i knew it had something to do with with uh movement 
and be and creating content but mm. i i just still i was so insecure man about all of these things and then have and then on top of that like dealing with like the whole i mean rent is really high and prices are really high and mm -hmm. and just trying to survive out there and like yeah make a living you know i was a bartender um i did like do a lot of training over there i did perform in some clubs um as a fire performer as yeah. a performer in general but i wasn't enjoying it because i wasn't doing it for i was doing it to survive i wasn't doing it for me anymore mm -hmm. so yeah i realized i mean and I, then you you came back you came from la back to florida yeah back to florida i'm living at my mom's right now honestly and dude i i lived i lived with my parents for two years after school and they that allowed me to save up some money and eventually move out and so i think living with your parents is very underrated and it's something that like if, if i were I to give just... advice to people i would say I mean, this is very general, but if you can get a job where your parents live and they're willing to have you in the house for a little to no rent, then do that for a year or two, save up money, and then go to another spot. Because I think it's better to have that flexibility than to maybe take a a uh, job that pays you more in a place where the rent is just going to eat away at you. So I think living with your parents is an underrated move after school. Absolutely. I, th I mean, you, you kind of just have to like weigh your options. Like, what are you going to get? What do you like? You're not going to have the privacy. I mean, everybody has different circumstances. Like everybody has a different relationship with their parents, with their loved ones. You know, it's, it's not up to me to say like, no, oh, you should do it or you shouldn't. And it's yeah. a culture thing. It's also, but if you're doing it on the basis of like, Hey, like what are people going to think of me? Like, then maybe that's like not the best option to weigh, you know, like yeah, really giving a lot of value to what other people think of you is not the best option mm -hmm. <laughs> ever yeah because you're gonna not be genuine to yourself you're not gonna attract the things that you want in your into your life and you're not gonna be aligned with those things yeah and you can't control what other people think of you so there's no sense in in worrying about it there's a seven billion people in the world like not all of them are gonna like you most of them aren't and that's totally fine so what's your day-to-day -day like right now in terms of training and, and working and making content, things like that? So um, I usually wake up like 7.30-ish, um, wake up, meditate, um, do a little bit of stretching, take out the dogs, come back. <laughs> then uh, yeah you don't, you don't have, you don't have to go uh like exactly if you if you don't want to like half hour oh, by okay. half hour you, you can you can just say uh like in the morning i do this and then like training kind of like training and working and, and making content because i know th those are three things of you know that comprise a lot of what you do yeah so i i mean every single day i work out i make at least three to four maybe five to seven pieces of content mm -hmm. and um i said workout content and then um that's pretty much it right now i mean i'm i'm working like i'm just training putting most of my hours into my training and making content because that's what i the two things i can do right now um until restaurants open back up so and is that how you would you describe yourself right now as a movement artist and an entertainer because you said you're an entertainer is that if you were to like give yourself a job title on linkedin what would it say right now for looking entertainer. for entertainer yeah so what are what are some of the the movements that you're training the most right now when you go into the gym so i'm training my compression strength 
for when I get back to um, aerial training and gymnastics. Mm -hmm. um, so that I can do a lot of the moves a lot easier and use up less strength and use a lot more uh, technique to get me to mm -hmm. all like basically make all of these moves easier. There's that there's a, a one arm handstand that I've wanted for like the longest time. Like ever since I started doing a handstand, I was like, how, how long is it going to take me to do a, a one? Yeah. And that's what everybody says, but it's just, it's so different for everybody. So just what, enjoy what's the, the best journey. way. What's the best way for people that are interested in learning how to do a handstand? Because I see, you know, we were talking about TikTok before. There's so many people on TikTok that are doing handstands and, and putting out tutorials. And you would know better than anyone. If you're starting to get into handstands or maybe you've never done one before, what does that process look like? Look like, like are, you, are you able to explain it over audio? Is there a way you could yeah, help people absolutely. out that are trying to do a handstand? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I would say first, it's all about self-awareness. So like start knowing your starting point, like, do you, can you do a lot of push-ups? Can you, um, do you have strong triceps? Like, have you been weight training? Like, do you have a lot of flexibility? So based on all of these things, you can say, okay, I'm going to start with a push-up or mm -hmm. I'm going to start with some arm balances that I can do and always like a great starting point for any of these like movements in general, like any of these hand balancing is yoga because you use a lot of that stability and strength and core, um, core strength to, to stabilize yourself while you're inverted. And there's also just inversions in yoga. Mm -hmm. So, um, I would go through, so I would go through, okay, push up, you have a down dog, and then now let's start with some arm balances. So you go to crow or a frog stand, and then after a frog stand, you would say, okay, now I can do those two, like pretty solid. Um, let's... What does a frog stand look like? So a frog stand is like, <clears throat> it's kind of like a crow, mm -hmm. but it's... It, like this is a crow yeah and a frog stand is just like instead of it instead of your knee being like by your by your elbow it's on mm -hmm. the outside so it's just balanced and gotcha like crow. and, and then, for people listening to this there will there'll be a version on youtube where you can see uh you can see kamal demonstrating yeah yeah so and then once you're graduated up to that then you could go into a, a a headstand mm -hmm. which you kind of just like make a pyramid right by your face interlock your hands and then put that cradle that you just made on the mm -hmm. back of your head oh gotcha yeah so he's cradling and then doing what is that called that's, that's called a the, headstand that's called the headstand okay and then there's a forearm stand all of these like by the way like when you first start practicing them, just do them, just do it against the wall. Like it's mm -hmm. going to make it a lot easier. You're going to focus on just the strength that it takes and the balance and the muscle memory so that once you can graduate to the different moves, you're not working. Like it, it doesn't take as much time for you to get back up. So you can just keep on practicing that same move for like five minutes instead of one second and then you're like oh no i don't want to get up there <laughs> so mm -hmm. you yeah. stop doing it so yeah. after the headstand you do a forearm stand and then, okay so now he's on his forearms and then you graduate to a handstand to the handstand so that's the that's the progression that's and you said start against the wall so you can kind of feel it feel it yeah, out with a barrier so, yeah, to recap, the, the progression would be um, push up, crow, and frog stand, then uh, headstand against the wall, then off the wall, then forearm stand against the wall and off the wall, then it would be handstand against the wall and then off the wall. Gotcha. Yeah, th there's a. Uh... 
a handstand is something that is cool to just be able to do in front of other people like it's, it's a cool a, party always, trick yeah like whenever i see someone do it at a party even even back in school like if someone could just break out some crazy move or like a dance move or like a do a handstand move. or something yeah i'm just like holy fuck like it immediately gets people's attention and you don't need that much space to do it you don't you just need your own body too that's yeah. that's also like a huge a huge um advantage in this time in this quarantine honestly that i already have this body awareness like the self-awareness that i can i mean i can work out with just my body i can mm -hmm. do all these things i know how the mechanics of it because when you're learning calisthenics and yoga and everything like this you're really just learning how to utilize your body to become stronger like you don't need yeah. weights you don't need anything and then all of this strength could actually be put to skills that you have yeah you know? yeah that's something i wanted to get into so for the average person like myself who is not advanced in movement art or circus art and maybe doesn't have access to a huge amount of weights because they're in quarantine. Maybe they have a pull-up bar, a few resistance bands, a couple dumbbells. What are some underrated strength exercises that that person can do in quarantine with limited equipment that can maximize efficiency? So, so maybe like some non-complicated exercise that the average person can do that will have a high return on strength. Hmm. Well, there's, there's a lot because there's different s strength, but I mean, a lot of the full body workouts, like you can do, mm -hmm. like you can do a deadlift with one, like, let's say you don't have weights. So mm -hmm. you, I mean, a deadlift is no longer challenging, but now you can do it with one leg. And you could grab like anything, like grab a book, like mm -hmm. grab anything heavy with the other leg. And you're literally, it's going to, it's going to burn. Like you're going to, yeah. So, and it's so very, single very leg, efficient. So single yeah. leg deadlift. I've even seen people, I just see the, the backpacks on your door. A lot of people will fill up backpacks with books or, you know, whatever they have in their apartment and just use that as a weight, which you can do to fill up your backpack yeah and well if you don't like you said if you do have equipment or if you just have like some bands or a pull up mm -hmm. bar so if you i mean if you don't have equipment just a push-up is is great there's also just retracting and protracting your scapula mm -hmm. so that you can so if you're not like really great at a push-up you could just do that for an extended period of time so like 30 minutes in a set like in a circuit so that you gain that strength to be able to do a push-up at mm -hmm. the end so like it, there's always like so many different progressions to everything if you're really really struggling on one thing then that means that you're not really you're not doing the right progression in the exercise and if an instructor can't instruct you to do your pro your certain pro progression you should probably get another instructor <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah i guess i guess that would be a good way to approach it so to to complete the the circuit because we have single leg deadlifts push-ups and scat push-ups what are a couple other exercises that people can add in to complete the the full body circuit as an uh, example there's, there's so many band exercises that you can do um there's just pulling them side like this this is really mm -hmm. good for your your um back shoulder yeah and then there's this one there's one that you you can always tie it up to a door or something like that mm -hmm. there's this and, one. and again there's, there's just there's going to be a version on youtube where you can see kamal demonstrating all of these so if you're just listening to this though i'll put the youtube link in the podcast description there's these, um, let's see, the ab workouts um, are really amazing, like when when you're doing, 
when you're doing not just crunches mm -hmm. because when you're only doing crunches you only work a, like really your your mid the top abdominal. the top yeah, yeah the top and like the mid really yeah and if you work both sides so you do v-ups and if you can't do this just go like this so, you can keep your so hands down yeah yeah keep your hands down and if you can't do that then just stay like this you can just hold it there yeah exactly hold it and this is really good for your handstand if you're working on your handstand the work the way that you work um a handstand without like being inverted or even just like the core stability it gets to be inverted mm -hmm. is you lay back you lay flat on the ground mm -hmm. and you put your you make sure that your lower back is touching the ground mm -hmm. extend your feet and extend your arms and just flex there just hold it there for like a minute yeah that so you try you try not to arch your back up you try to make keep exactly. your lower back and then contact with the ground yeah that'll get your like the muscle memory it takes for your core to mm -hmm. to not flop basically while you're yeah. inverted so i'll i'll ask you a similar question for mobility so f so for the average person who uh is maybe sitting around for 17 hours a day at their desk they have a normal nine to five job they're working out maybe three to four times a week with resistance or, or weights what are you think three to four underrated mobility exercises and you can present it in a circuit again too you don't it doesn't have to be just one part of the body yeah that would be helpful for someone who is sedentary for a large portion of the day so um definitely if you're if you're a sedentary for most of the day i would and if you're sitting in a chair nine to five or anything like that that's really going to hurt your posture mm -hmm. so you want this you don't want that so you want to open mm -hmm. up your shoulders back yeah so what you want to do is interlock your your fingers the back of your so i'm doing it interlock now too. your fingers yeah and the back and then just bring that down and do a forward fold from there. That's like one of the most underrated and like the best thing for your posture. Yeah. For, so this exercise, and if you can't do that, you can also just grab a rope or even just a band. If you can't reach mm -hmm. and do the same thing. Yeah, I guess you could use a towel too. Sometimes I'll use a towel to like uh, to do that exercise where you interlock your fingers. That too, yeah. Sometimes I'll use a towel to connect it and like pull up to to connect. If you can't nice. reach, you can use a band or a towel. Nice. And uh, for your hamstrings, I would say downward dog. For like the average mm -hmm. person, would be incredible. And if you're if you want to challenge while you're in downward dog you can always grab the opposite hand to the opposite mm -hmm. foot or the mm -hmm. hand to the opposite foot and then just ha add an extra stretch right there and hold it there and hold it there and you learn that from yoga right because downward dog is from yoga. from yoga yeah uh what i also learned from yoga is pigeon pose which a lot of people um you said um like they don't they don't really take care of like opening up their hips so yeah pigeon pose really does that well um if you're listening to this pigeon pose just go go pigeon pose <laughs> yeah yeah this is some this is something that i actually do every morning a pigeon pose for a minute each side if i go a few days without doing it i can really feel it in my hips like how i'm someone that definitely is that tends more to be tighter so yeah. for me if i don't keep a baseline stretch of four to five times a week then i definitely feel myself tightening up like i can feel it the next time i do it i'm like wow my hip feels tight that's a yeah. good that's a good one there's that one and then there's uh just basically it's stretching your stretching your middle split but instead mm -hmm. of that you just cut it so you bend at the knee 
Mm-hmm. And then you spread the knee out. And then your toes pointed outward. And then toes pointed outward. Yeah. yeah. You, you really kind of just rock back and forth. Like from here, mm-hmm. you can go down to here. Gotcha. That's really what you want. What else? What else can we do? I, I'd say for stretching, so like a very sedentary person. We talked about chest openers. It could be like your average person too. It doesn't have to be like super sedentary. So just anything you think would be helpful to the average person. Um, I mean, forward folds, like I, I think are one of the most underrated, like, like um, stretches you could possibly do, especially mm-hmm. because people just do it wrong. I mean, it's not. What do, what do they do wrong about it? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to tell you right now. So there's a lot of technique that it just has to do with breathing. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really have to do with any any of what your body is actually doing. So you take a breath and then you exhale down. You bring your chest up. You don't want to arch your back while you're doing it. You don't want to mm-hmm. like... Um, hunch your back while you're going yeah. down. So you really want to bring that chest. If this is like the most I can do today, then I'm just going to go here and then bring my neck down. So you want to maintain good posture while you do it. You don't want your exactly. back to curl up. Okay. Exactly. So you want to keep that chest open, bring it down. And then w- when I can't bring it down anymore, that's when I bring my neck down. And you should feel it all the way down to the back of your um Mm-hmm. to your lower back so that's how you know you're stretching right especially yeah. don't stretch for less than seven seconds it really just does not do a lot for the body especially because your body is sending pain signals to your muscles mm-hmm. at first like seven to eight seconds or seven to ten seconds i'm not sure, really sure what this is um so you don't really get that that relaxed feeling yeah, that's why people say stretching hurts so much because they're not i mean yeah it does hurt don't get me wrong but it's also relaxing at the end if you let that if you let if you relax into the stretch yeah i mean that's that's something that yoga teaches you and i haven't i haven't been in a consistent yoga routine for a while but one of the things i always enjoyed about it especially hot yoga is that you just breathe into the stretch or if you feel uncomfortable don't try to ignore it just acknowledge the discomfort and kind of breathe into it and and use it like use your breath to go further teaches you about life (laughs) yeah yeah, exactly so breathe into life (laughs) how so speaking of breathing how did you get into meditation because that's something that i also do um yoga Honestly, that's that's honestly why it's it's one of the first tools, like one of the first things I tell people to do, like if you haven't moved or if you don't move or if you're sedentary, if you're just getting into movement, like just step into a yoga class, see how you Mm -hmm. do, like follow the progressions, don't go too fast. And also meditation, like what we were talking about. do you have a separate meditation practice from yoga or do you use yoga as your meditation? I kind of start off. So I do my own yoga practice now, mm-hmm. nowadays. Um, but I kind of just start moving to start getting into my body and then I'll sit down. And once I'm ready, I'll, I'll say, okay, 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, maybe however I'm feeling that day. But I'll just make sure that um, I'll first start focusing on my breath and starting to, you know, fight with my primal brain, just kind of like all these thoughts coming into my head and me not being able to silence them out. Yeah. And then, you know, as you, you know, start being patient with yourself, you're not going to the the one thing that i see with meditation with a lot of people starting meditation is they get impatient because they say oh no i can't stop my my thoughts like that's impossible yeah, yeah you're right 
to a certain degree, but it's, it takes a little bit of patience, like going to, to work out, you know, like most of the days I'm not going to feel amazing. I just show up and do it. And then mm -hmm. one of those days, like I'm going to feel like I'm a Zen God. <laughs> like, yeah. like I totally tune out everything and just focus on like the blankness of what is like the infinite yeah. slate of like well, your life. Yeah, I, I use this app called Waking Up that's by Sam Harris, and that lets you do 10 or 20 minute meditations every morning. And I usually do a 20 minute meditation in the morning. And then sometimes I'll do a 10 minute one at night or later in the day. And like what you were saying, there are days where I feel like for 20 straight minutes, I was not focusing at all. I was thinking about all the bullshit I had to do that day. Maybe I'll go in and out of paying attention to a few breaths here and there. But for the majority of it, it was, you know, people wouldn't, I wouldn't describe it as this moment of Zen or like, I, I don't want people to think that meditation is some magic bullet where like, if you don't no. feel, if you don't feel, you know, connected to the spirituality of everything around you, that you're doing it wrong there. There are definitely times where you break through that lens and you feel super mindful and present and that's what makes it all worth it. But just sitting down for five minutes a day, which is what I started with. I, I, set, I started with a, a timer, not mm -hmm. the meditation app, where I would just put five minutes on the clock, sit there. My mind would race, almost gave up after two weeks. But then after a month, started to notice a difference where I felt myself becoming less reactive and I was actually pausing more than I used to if someone would insult me or if, or if you know I felt myself getting angry I would notice the bodily sensations of that person just called me an asshole or I'm really angry right now or I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling happy like I I wouldn't just react to my emotions and so after a month I, I definitely think that you should stick with it for at least a month five days a week every day if you can before you judge it because I wanted to give up after two weeks. It's been almost two years and it's been probably the most life changing habit that I've adopted up there with, you know, working out and yeah, eating well, like I, I would put meditation in there for your, for your just overall mental health and, and spiritual and, and physical health. It kind of leaks over into everything. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's been it it's been one of the most life changing habits as well for me. It's just do you use an app? Down. Do you use I, an app or use a timer? What I, is your practice I would look use, like? So I would use at first. I would use uh, like YouTube guided meditations. Uh, then I just started using the sounds, and then I just cut out the sounds in general. But um first first of all like before that i just was doing shavasana so like at the end of a yoga practice you get down like you lay on your back and you do a 10 minute meditation so that's kind of how i started doing it you know it's at first mm -hmm. you have kind of have like these oh my god everybody's looking uh, yeah like, shavasana <laughs> is the, the dead body pose right like yeah, you're supposed to just you're relax just every muscle your in your body yeah mm -hmm. like the heart some some yoga teacher yeah, some yoga teachers have told me that that's the hardest thing to do is actually relax every muscle in your body that it takes you know years and years and years of practice to actually do a true savasana shavasana yeah yeah because i mean we hold so much tension like especially the it, being also that also teaches you a lot of self-awareness like meditation because you i mean i feel tension in my jaw that i haven't felt before you know mm -hmm. and what you were saying i really wanted to touch on that that yeah you have this pause like before you you okay so i'm i get insulted and i have this pause now to either react or to think about what i'm acting so like to think with intention or to react to what my like my primal reaction is so my primal reaction is hey like i just want to get back at you and like insult you back but me like thinking for a second like is that really gonna actually help me then i just have a different reaction which trickles down to everything in your life trickles down to like all of these interactions that you have so people mm -hmm. 
we'll just see you as a nicer person and you'll be a yeah. nicer person and it'll, it'll feel better. Are there any cues that help you in particular when you're meditating? I know you mentioned you focus on your breath. Is there anything that you tell yourself specifically? Like, for example, with my breath, if I'm trying to come back to it, sometimes I'll focus on a specific area of my body where I feel it, like maybe my upper chest or my belly. Sometimes I'll focus on my nostrils where like I want to feel that first. That's mine. That first like wisp of air and then like all the way to the last out. There also uh, Sam Harris has some cues in the app where if you do a meditation with your eyes closed, because he leads it with eyes closed and open, often both in the same session, to stare into the darkness behind your eyes like you would if you your eyes were open. So like just because your eyes are closed doesn't mean you can't look into your eyes like a sunset. Like you still see shapes and colors and shadows. Like look into your eyes like you would look out onto the horizons. Wow. So a lot of times that helps me. And then the last one I would say well, that I'm took me that down. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um so there's I focus on the breath. I focus on staring into the darkness behind my eyes and then I also focus on so something recently that he brought up in the app is breathing in the world towards you like when you breathe in like imagine you're in a car where like you're you see the you, when you're in a car you, you can see the world coming towards you like when you're going forward you could see yourself going forward or you can see the world kind of being pulled towards you so when you breathe in imagine the world's being pulled towards you if you're staring at a wall while you're doing it or you know whatever you're looking at imagine like the world's coming in slightly towards you and then when you breathe out, like imagine it's it's you're pushing yourself out into the world, like the world's going away from you a little bit. And when I really yeah. get into the zone, it's I can almost feel the room. It's like breathing with me a little bit, like yeah. the, it's coming towards me a little bit. And then the room like goes away from me a little bit. That's... And it, it doesn't always feel like that. But on on days where I'm really feeling it, it's it's a helpful cue because it kind of gets you out of your own thoughts. It helps you visualize and be in this moment and not think about what you're going to be doing or what has happened or any kind of emotions that you might be holding on to. Like that is the thing that you need to focus on. I focus on my nostrils like mm -hmm. like you do. Um, like, some, like that's what I start off with. Sometimes I'll even start counting one, two, three, four for the for the inhale and then one, two, three, four for for the exhale just to like have an even breath so that it's rhythmic and mm -hmm. that really really gets my my body in tune to um be relaxed and just kind of let go of things for a certain moment and i would yeah. i would honestly say it's like going to work out for your brain like think about it like that because mm -hmm. if you think about it, about it as like just meditation then it's not it, i don't know how people like think about it like this connotation of like it all being hippy dippy and not actually yeah. reliable well, well, I, and successful like it is like i think kobe I think, bryant all of these people amazing musicians amazing human beings do it yeah i think right now meditation has a stigma of you people know it's good for you and it's becoming popular as an industry where there are a lot of apps and people creating content about it. And there's a lot of opportunity to make money off of it, which I think also brings with it some negativity because not everyone is the best teacher and, and is actually teaching what meditation is and, and how and what it stands to for. do it. Yeah. But I do think that 20, 30 years from now, people will look back on meditation and, people will think of people that don't meditate like they think of people that don't don't go to the gym like today if someone told you yeah i never work out like i haven't worked out in five years you'd be like come on dude get it together like at least walk on the treadmill for a few times a week for 30 minutes or you know lift for two to three times a week i think in the future people if, if you say you don't meditate people will have similar reactions to you saying I don't work out because like you were saying it's the mind it's the gym for your mind so if you work out your body you should be working out your mind too 
Absolutely. Amen. Yeah. And I think, at least for me, that that what I hope people take away from this is that even as someone who's meditated for two years, and and there are people that are so much more experienced than me and that actually teach the meditation practice and have been doing it for decades, I can speak for myself as someone who who's been doing it for two years. I definitely have days where I feel super frustrated and I feel like I'm not focused at all and I'm not in control of my thoughts and you get better as you go along but if you feel that at the beginning which you will don't stop just just sitting down and doing the the time at first will help you get to those moments where you you feel a clarity and the goal isn't to become a better meditator because it doesn't mean anything if you're not carrying it over into the rest of your life it's to just live better and be kinder to people and be be less reactive so even if you have a session where you think oh like you know i sat down for five minutes my thoughts were racing i i didn't even you know i I didn't focus on my breath one time you're still getting to a point where you're you're helping the carryover and the transition into your life where you're at least trying to become more mindful so just doing the work at first is enough don't feel like you have to be in the super zen zone absolutely i i mean i i also compare it to just i mean when i first get into the gym like i'm doing 10 pounds you know like i'm not going 35 pounds like all the way like i don't just get there like it's the same thing with meditating. Like, I'm not just gonna like tune everything out when I haven't been tuning anything out, like for the, my entire life. Like I need Mm -hmm. to first sit down, be patient with myself and show up. Like it's, Mm -hmm. it's like you said, it's half, I guess I had not even half, like more than half, 80% of the battle is just showing up. Like Mm -hmm. you set a time to do this, do it. That's it. (laughs) <laughs> no excuses yeah. everything is showing up so would it would it be fair to say based on what you do and how you spend your time that you find movement and the art of movement more beautiful than the average person like there's something to you about it that cuz you feel not only driven to be around it but you actually want to use it to entertain other people is that fair to say that you find it more yeah. beautiful than the average is there something you could say that would articulate to listeners what it is that you find more beautiful about movement and, and the connection to the body? Um, movement is medicine. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like if you feel a- anxiety, move. If you are like it, it could be in like a theoretical sense that you take this or like a literal sense like actually move like it um i'm feeling anxious about the content i'm making create more like it's not just movement in general but just do more and then actually getting back to movement i think movement is is medicine but it's also just a way to get to know this vehicle better like this mm-hmm. is the only body that we get. So, I mean, if you're not building the best vehicle to run your life, to put you into the places that you want to get to, then it's not going to run for you. It's not, mm-hmm. you're, you're not going to be in control of it. Your primal instincts, your cravings for food, your cravings for other things are going to run your life it's not Mm -hmm. your self-awareness not your discipline not your body that's gonna run it so take care of this vehicle and it'll take care of you movement is medicine movement is medicine. well said so if i if i watched every performance you ever did and i watched every piece of content you ever put out i knew your whole background story in even greater detail than what you've described today what is it that there's in your life? What What is it that's influencing you in your life that I would have no idea about by what I've seen or know about you? What's the hidden influence in your life? Mm. 
<laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's just. I don't know if it's just like. Love, honestly, it's just con like a deeper sense of just like wanting to connect with others. Like that's what I do to entertain. That's what I do when I teach. That's what I do when I when I talk. Like it's just to connect with others so that we can thrive better. Yeah, we're all yeah, that, together. Yeah, that that's uh that's the part about entertainers that I. I think it thinks uh, I can't speak. I think it's overlooked for, you know, people that are on stage or, or performing or, or singing, whatever they're doing. Yes, they have a drive to be seen and they want to make something of themselves. And, you know, even me, like I, I have narcissistic uh, components yeah, in my personality. You where that's, yeah, yeah like, like I want to be podcast. I want to make money off it. I want to be known. Yeah. But then on the other side of that, the Zach is, attack. You, podcast yeah. yeah my my uh my baseball nickname from little league Z Zach oh, Attack. Zach Attack. um but yes there you you have that drive to be known and you want to be the center of attention and, and you want people to see what you're doing but then on the other side of that you have that drive to connect with people and and reach people with what you're doing you not only want to you, you not only want them to see you but you want to touch them in some way and kind of inspire them to do whatever it is that they want to do not necessarily what you're doing but it's their truth it, yeah it's like whatever you like feel inclined to doing it's i mean not a lot of people are, are like really intuitive really in tune with what your urges are but it's it's like me being myself and not caring what other people think of me like mm -hmm. not to say that i'm just gonna be like fuck everybody <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> but i'm just saying like i don't care what you think about me but i love you like yeah. even if you say like your video sucks user 1735 like <laughs> that's that awesome. was me that was me i made a bot account user oh true that was you bro yeah, yeah. i fucking yeah. knew it was you bro yeah that was me <laughs> what, are you, what are you gonna do <laughs> But uh, what I'm saying is I I don't I don't mind what you think of me and that gives you the liberty to not give a fuck what anybody else yeah. thinks of you so that you yeah. can just do you and live yeah. happily and not be like, hey, I need to work because if not, then people won't think I'm worthy of love, which yeah. is that. It's Yeah, I mean that's a that's a that's a good point that it's something I struggle with is that I don't feel worthy when I'm not producing content or working or doing something. So Picture I think a good fire. test of, yeah, a good test of how happy you are is if you're, if you do nothing for 20 minutes or, or an hour or a day, how anxious are you are. still happy? Yeah. Like, do you, do you still feel that, that need? So that's something I'm, I'm definitely working on. I, I love producing content. I love creating, so but then also I... being okay with who I am when I'm not doing that and, and seeing my own, worth and there's something else there's something else i wanted to say on what you said you're talking about love and not uh not caring giving other people, other people not caring yes not caring what other people think so i don't think for me i don't say i give zero fucks like i don't i i won't pretend to be one of those guys who just Dude, can nobody not give a shit about nobody anything. Nobody gives zero fucks. Like, but but I think it's about giving the right. Impossible. I think it's about giving the right fucks. The yeah. the people who are close to you, your friends, your family, your girlfriend, to have a small circle of people where you check in and see, okay, if if they think I'm doing all right, if they're okay with me, then I'm okay with me. But then beyond that, for people on social media or people that don't know you that well that's the fucks that I try not to give. And then I try to give the fucks about people who actually know who I am. Like if, if my mom doesn't like who I am, then I know that I'm doing something wrong. But if someone else, a random user 1735 is like, yo, fuck you, you're a piece of shit. Then I'm like, all right, whatever. Like he doesn't know me. Uh, so I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I, I feel you. I, I definitely feel you on the mom thing. Yeah. Um, 
but at the same time even even those people that are really really close to you i mean i i love them i just don't really care if i mean like i it's not like i'm gonna you know cause any harm to them that's the thing it's like Mm -hmm. it's just about the content you're that you're producing like if it feels genuine to you and you want to try it out and you want to give this i don't know the whatever video a chance like Mm -hmm. just post it like don't yeah don't be so don't be so hard on yourself don't think that you have to meet this criteria i think that's the one thing that i'm struggling with is listen like i love them so much like i really do but that's not the kind of content like they're going to be consuming that's Mm -hmm. not the kind of stuff they're going to watch but yeah but they but the thing is they love me for it too and that's fine and i love them back it's just yeah sometimes we think like oh they're really not gonna like me and they're really not but right now i just literally just started making content and that i would think oh like they're gonna hate me for this like i don't care like and yeah i love you (laughs) yeah but i don't care i'm sorry yeah i think i think a good point to make too is is that when i when i say checking in with my mom or my parents i don't mean about the type of content i'm creating i just mean more the type of person i am so i even if my parents don't like my content i'm I'm still gonna make it i'm gonna make whatever yeah. i think is interesting and and true and engaging to me but if my parents i have a problem with how i'm living like the type of person how i'm treating other people then then i know when i'm going wrong and yeah, i also have a good relationship they, they, i have a good relationship you know with my they parents. raised you well that's yeah I, I have a good relationship values. yeah i'm lucky that i have a good relationship with my parents for other people you know maybe you don't have a great relationship with your parents maybe they don't treat you well so they're in that category of like i don't give a fuck like i love you but i i don't give a shit what you think because yeah. you didn't treat me well so i i'm saying that from the perspective of someone who has a good relationship with their parents but i know not everyone is lucky enough to have that so i'm I, i'm very fortunate yeah and i'm great i'm grateful for it too that's that's the kind of relationship i have with my parents as well yeah so I, as we wrap up i have a i have a couple questions for you one is about fiction so i don't know what type of fiction you are into what whether it's tv or books or movies but if you could choose one character to be your mentor and someone that you could actually talk to in real life that's a fictional character who would you choose <laughs> oh my god <laughs> what uh and he's not real like he never existed he or she, yeah not, not yeah like they're fictional something you someone you saw on a show or like a character you read about someone you admire um if fiction is too specific then then i'll broaden it to just you can use someone maybe they're dead maybe they still exist so i don't if you don't uh have someone in mind in fiction feel free to say someone i mean honestly like well if it's not fictional it would be like stevie wonder or something because stevie wonder's a good one oh my god that his dynamic like musical ear like genius is just out of this world and then just the way he lives his life is absolutely incredible too yeah what what he emanates and like what he gives to others um if it is fictional oh my god i couldn't even tell you what is the last i read a lot of self-help books and a lot of like yeah um, i'm very like creative but like Mm -hmm. i'm left-brained in the books that i read so like Mm -hmm. i'll be reading like the power of habit like seven yeah yeah and i just got back i just got into some more fiction books because i was the same way i was reading a lot of non-fiction but yes what what is your take on that what is your take on that so for probably two years i've read almost exclusively nonfiction, and i'll get my fiction through 
watching or listening to some podcast maybe Mm -hmm. but i just felt like i was missing out on something by not reading fiction even though i'm learning i'm I'm learning about a world that doesn't exist Mm -hmm. i can still take benefits away from that in terms of creativity and the way that i think about things like the book that i'm reading right now that's fiction is the handmaid's tale and they Mm -hmm. they there's also the the show on hulu where i'm not super far into it but no you're good yeah i'll be right you're good What show was it? Uh, the, the Handmaid's Tale, a book that I'm reading right now. I'm not super far into it, but it's like futuristic, has to deal with uh, the women becoming pregnant and basically being used as, as vessels. And even though it's not a true story, I can still take things away from a fictional work that I can apply creatively to podcasting or writing articles or making TikTok videos, whatever it is. So I'm still going to read a lot of nonfiction, but I'm going to make sure to mix in fiction books every once in a while just to switch it up. Thanks for that take. I'm going to write that down. Oh, yeah, dude. Check out, uh, check no, out The man. Handmaid's Tale. Handmaid's Tale. Um, gotcha. So the, the last thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, for – for the average person that may or may not have that probably doesn't have a lot of extra time during the day maybe they have kids and they're going to work and they put their kids to bed eat and then by the time they're done their day's over so maybe they only have 15 20 minutes of free time during the day what's the piece of information that they should take away from this podcast to make better decisions about movement if they were to take away one thing about movement that would help them do it better with limited time? Um, what I would say is time cannot be an excuse, especially one, because it's your body. It should be prioritized over other stuff. Mm -hmm. Two, we can always make more time. There's some time that you know, really just gets like pushed under the rug, like, oh, I really need to like watch, watch this like three hour Netflix special, like, no, Mm -hmm. you probably don't, you could take, and then that's the third one, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, even, if you really like are cutting it down, and you really think you don't have time, you could do 10 minutes. I'm telling you, that is more than it's astronomical the changes you can make especially because your your brain doesn't actually shut down so like all of these things that you're you're um all of these things so like let's say you do 10 minutes of exercises like your brain when you go to sleep is actually rehearsing all of these exercises it's like doing it in your head so the next time that you do it it's going to be easier not only physically but mentally Mm -hmm. So you're not going to go through the strain of thinking like, oh, I have to do this. Like you're just going to do it and it's going to take over. And then once that gets through, like, okay, let's add in like five more minutes. It's fine. And for those people that think, oh, no, that's too little of time. Like I'm really not going to make that much progress. Like it. Yeah, it really depends on your goals, like where you want to go versus like where you are right now. But like. I am telling you 10 to 15 minutes of handstand practice each day has gotten me this far. Like Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's not, it hasn't been three hours one day and then I go back to it in three weeks. Like 
it's every single day like this little much like just a little bit better just a little bit better on the wall just a little bit better handstand so, headstand just a little bit better just a little bit better like 10 minutes and i've gone months without doing it years mm -hmm. like well not years but like six months seven months without doing a handstand and then you just go back to it so it's it's really all about building that base so that you can have a good base for your life and for your fitness in general so that when you get to work you're not like running out of energy you're not doing all these things you're not sluggish you have more energy because of all of all of this exercise that you're doing so that life stresses don't get to you it's more about you're putting the stress onto yourself mm -hmm. by doing this exercise so that when you're when you're at work and Mandy tells you that you didn't do the report right, you could just be like, I mean, I did 20 push ups. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's not obviously it doesn't work like that, but yeah. I, I did 20 push ups. Like, I can handle this like stress. It's yeah. less stress. I have more energy because yeah. I don't, I don't think of those things as stress. Like, I can work up a sweat. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, long term investments of, small chunks of daily time can have a huge, huge effect. Difference. Huge difference. Well, thank you, Kamal, for hopping on the podcast. Thank it's you, been man. a blast talking to you. I know a lot of people are going to benefit from this podcast, from meditation, movement, what we talked about with your journey across America and the buildup of your background. I know a lot of people are going to find a lot of value in what you've said and your words today so so thanks again thank you brother thank you zach for having me on i appreciate you